large, the largest port in the United States. We did that. We did it on time, almost on time. Uh, we were, it was scheduled to be completed on time in 2014, in time for the opening of the Panama Canal. This was an amazing feat, both of engineering and of <coughs> management and policy. Uh, couldn't have happened without a lot of the people who I here at the, on the panel with me and people that are out in the audience. Uh, really have to say that the Corps of Engineers and the EPA uh, showed some extraordinary leadership, as well as the city of New York and the state of New Jersey, uh, to be able to pull together the pieces of a somewhat mismanaged and disparate uh, dredge material management policy. It just really didn't exist. It does now. Um, but that having been said, we haven't been able to keep costs down. We haven't been able to keep options up. And so consequently, we're, in a, we're at a crossroads right now. We, we are finding it very difficult to provide economically viable options for what we call small quantity generators, those smaller operations that are so important to keeping a port vital. Uh, we heard a lot this morning about a working waterfront. Working waterfront is essential uh, part of the uh, waterfront plan. And we aren't able to provide options that are economically acceptable to those folks. A lot of those folks can't even get a permit under today's regulatory environment to say nothing about being able to dredge and then manage. So we need to do something about that. And, uh, and our, our, even our federal program is about to get a significant reality check when we move from capital dredging to maintenance dredging. And we have to compete with every other port in this country for limited dredging dollars. Uh, it's a lot easier to get capital dollars than it is to get maintenance dollars. And that's always been true in transportation, and it's particularly too true in dredging. What we really need is a plan that encompasses our entire maritime system. Both the large operations like the core uh, navigation channels and the small operations like our small quantity generators, the tug and, and ferry operations. Um, we need more options in order to keep costs down, that competitive edge. We need to have that. We need to have all of our uh, dredge material management team players working to come up with uh, ever increasing efficiencies and ever decreasing costs. Um, we also need to work cooperatively so that we can achieve economies of scale. Uh, and we need to uh, be mindful of regional planning practices. The more we look at regional sediment management, the more likely we are to come up with solutions which are viable for the long haul and for everybody involved. So what should we do? I must say that uh, this is something that uh, the regional dredging team for New York, New Jersey Harbor has been struggling with for quite some time. We don't know what all the answers are. There are some that have suggested that there are other harbors out there that have the magic bullet. We'll have some folks here today uh, to talk about what some other harbors are doing. Do they have a magic bullet? Are they able to do it? I don't know. We'll find out. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to let you read the bios of, of these fine folks, but I'm going to give a very brief uh, capsule of uh, who they are and uh, where they're from. Maybe a little anecdote if I happen to know something about them by way of introduction as they give their five minutes of, uh, of uh, material and insights. Uh, everything that they know about dredging and dredge material management boiled down into the essence uh, that they can deliver in five minutes to, the, to give all of you a chance to ask us questions. Um, hopefully you can uh, help us all come, we can all come to uh, some nuggets that we can share with a larger group about how to solve this problem and fix it. So I'm going to start um, by introducing the man on my right here. It's been uh, Eric Stern and I have been friends for uh, about 20 years now, uh, working in. Eric's now with ERM, in all of your work, huh? because we all know Eric as Decon for his 25 years of experience working with the US EPA on, on contaminated sediments in New York, New Jersey Harbor. There's anybody who knows more about contaminated sediments and what to do with them than Eric, and so I'm going to let him talk about what he thinks the issues are here. Great, thank you, Scott. Five minutes. I haven't done anything under two hours in my life. Um, first of all, I'd like to start off, and I echo Scott's uh, original statement about um, about changing the, the title of this session. Um, it was sort of a downer, but what really brings me down right now is 
is a spelling of, of dredge materials, and I'm surprised Price Wise and Melissa McCoy did not did not catch that price. It's uh, it's dredge materials management, and what I'd like to do is um, is in a sense give you some good news because misery misery enjoys company. Is that New York, New Jersey Harbor, in a sense, is is not alone globally. Uh, globally, there are many challenges to stretch material management and con and contaminate. Uh, on a global basis, uh, there are many ports and harbors globally that are in the same situation uh, nationally. There are confined disposal facilities at capacity. There are ocean placement regs in, in Europe that are becoming more stringent. And again, globally, it becomes, it's, it is quite a, uh, a global challenge. Um, in, the, in the port of New York and New Jersey, um, one of the, the, the good news is that we have a good platform to start on. Um, we all know that dredge materials and contaminated sediments are cross-programmed in nature and really need to be implemented in a bi-state regional sediment management program. And this is, this is not trivial in a sense because we, we, we are so, certainly in a dredge material box. But as Scott mentioned, my, my 24 years of, of, of public service, both with the Corps and EPA and now in the, in the private sector, looks at, looks at both dredge material and contaminated sediments, knowing that we have multiple programs, multiple, multiple regulatory authorities, and multiple agency missions whether they're aquatic brownfields, water programs, rigorous solid waste between New York and New Jersey, um, EPA Superfund, and so on. The good news is that we have a great platform, a regional sediment man management manual. Uh, there were people here that was part of it. It was, uh, it was uh, developed over the last three years. You can find it on HudsonRiver.org. That's something you may want to download after the conference and put it under your pillow this evening. Um, it was, it's a great platform to start on in the sense of looking at water quality, uh, quantity, and dredge material management, and looking at it as a, as a bi-state regional, regional plan. And again, the good news is that we have one. It's a, it's a great platform, and we should absolutely use it. The bad news is that, let's get over it, guys. The cost of dredge material management and remediate and slash remediation actually let's take a look at dredge material management um, is expensive and it will be continue to be ex expensive until uh, innovative forward thinking um, continues in a direction one of the areas that we've been looked that i've been looking at for for many years uh, is looking at again with my colleague scott and others is looking at development of a regional processing facility in the, in the port of New York and New Jersey. Uh, we went down a road a few years ago looking at regional set, uh, looking at a regional processing facility. It was, a, it was a good effort. A lot of work was put into it. And it's something that may, we may need to, to look at again. Um, ultimately, over time, um, source controls measures uh, will certainly decrease the cost of dredge material management in, in general. We need to pursue sustainable approaches. Sustainable approaches that look at innovative technology development and beneficial use applications, of course, looking at dredge material as a resource. Um, we need to integrate a out-of-the-box approach coupled with a integrated regional processing facility. And again, this will reduce cost in the long term. Um, Good news is that the Port of New York and New Jersey is, uh, has, has, has a lot of experience in this area. The bad news is that it's going to take a, uh, a, a behavioral shift um, if you're certainly looking at sustainable options as a, uh, as a driver. Another aspect is looking at, uh, and this is, is looking at other analogs, and this, this tends to be more on the contaminated remediation material is to look at where we are in the Port of New York, New Jersey as an urban sediment management platform. And when we look at programs like Superfund, this is a complex system with continuing sources, remediation, economic and watershed development applications. We need to 
Superfund is certainly the, the, the regulatory hammer for these type of, for, for cleanups. And again, as Scott mentioned, uh, remediation is critical to further enhancing uh, decreased costs in long-term dredge material management. Um, we need to look at analogs to other type of programs that, uh, that are models out there with, uh, with cost share public-private uh, applications. Uh, one of them is the uh, US EPA Great Lakes National Program Office Legacy Act, which looks at cleanup uh, of areas of concern sites with public-private cost share. Um, and I think finally, on my fifth uh, bullet, is that, again, going back to this behavioral shift, this outside-of-the-box concept, if we are looking at sustainability at a long-term view, we need to look at short versus long-term visions. Short-term crisis um, certainly doesn't help long-term innovative technology development. You kind of burn everybody out in looking at a political crisis, short-term vision or solution, and not really looking at your long-term end game. We need to look at leadership. Um, this, again, this concept, and I teach this, uh, on faculty of my class, State University, in my waste management class, looking at uh, eco psychology, and it's not a uh, you know Jerry Garcia moment in uh, dredge material management, but it's looking at a uh, at a behavioral shift in looking at and approaching dredge material management differently. We need to look at multi-program integration, a regional sediment management, and regional processing facility, and again looking at a platform of innovative technologies, looking at a hybrid, holistic. Uh, treatment train approach. Thank you. That was under two hours. Yeah. Thank you. Our uh, our next speaker is uh, Greg Hartman, and Greg is with uh, Hartman Associates. But he's got over 40 years of experience in waterways management, uh, waterways engineering, and uh, dredge material management, and mediation, and sediment. Much of that, or a bunch of that, with the core out west. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to hear a bit of a uh, uh, perspective from, from the other coast. I want to present this. This is kind of like the dredge design or the dredger. I'm the dredger that comes in. I expect to have problems. I figure out how much I need to charge you to remove your contaminated sediment or to remove your clean sediment. So this is basically going to look at projects primarily on the West Coast that have been permitted, have been approved, and have completed. Um, and certainly these uh, approaches are worth uh, concerning out here in the New York uh, project. Uh, also, I want to emphasize the uh, concept of adaptive management. Uh, I think we must expect and allow the opportunity to further develop our design after the final design is completed. Simply put, uh, working in the waterways today, it's not all clean material, it's not all beneficial material, and as such, uh, we fall under different regulations to complete the navigation projects or to complete the <coughs> habitat projects for uh, future use. Let's just go on to the slides now. Okay. Yeah, please. First of all, we'll talk about what kind of dredges we're going to use for the project. Well, simply put, there are two types of dredges in the world that we use. There's a the pipeline dredge. Next slide. Simply put, the pipeline dredge is a dredge that pumps 90% water with 60% material, a lot of water. So it has a uh, secondary problem. How much water that you pump out of the end of the pipeline and what's the cost uh, to control that water release? Then we have the mechanical dredge. Pretty simple. Mechanical dredge is mechanical. You drop the bucket on the bed, you close the bucket, you pick it up, you put it in a hull barge, and the barge transports the material to the disposal site. Next slide. We tend to have significantly less water with the uh, uh, mechanical dredge, but uh, we typically do not dredge uh, the same type of material uh, with the density, excuse me, we dig more dense material with a, with a uh, mechanical dredge than we do a pipeline. Why am I telling you about this? Well, this impacts the kind of uh, activity, if you will, the kind of dredging activity that we want to uh, permit and get approved. Next slide, please. Dredge, uh, dredge Fundamentals. I teach a class called Dredge Fundamentals uh, to the core. Uh, we have two week or three weeks uh, every year. Uh, we find out that dredging is a kind of a two word word. We talk about dredging, you know what? We don't have any dredging if we don't have disposal sites. So it's dredging and disposal. Every time you say dredging, you've got to include disposal in your consideration. There are confined disposal sites. 
undefined disposal sites, habitat creation and restoration. And probably the biggest problem we have and that you're having is uh, the political aspect of these disposal sites. People want a lot more out of what you can deliver in a dredging project than you can obtain. So we are continually kind of downplaying the problems, unfortunately, to get a project completed. Next slide. Let's take a look first. Here's the Heather Highless Waterway. This was a uh, maintenance dredging project that had some contaminated sediments, uh, uh, PCBs, in the project. Projects located in the upper half. This is in Tacoma, Washington. Next slide. This was done by a mechanical dredge. The mechanical dredge was placing the material into hall barges. The sediment they were digging was, a, was called a glacial loach or glacial till. A very fine grain sediment causes a significant amount of turbidity. So we had to control the uh, location and the transport of that sediment. Next slide. The material was taken to, the, uh, to a stockpile site by the hall barge. That was offloaded by front end loaders, literally, put in a temporary stockpile over here, and then slowly loaded on two rail cars by those same front end loaders. Next slide. Here's the project in stone. See up here, the, uh, <coughs> this is that uh, wharf area that I was talking about, the the material. So here's the stockpile. Here's the train cars that are coming in. You know, temporary hold until they go in the main line here, and then they're loaded and taken to the disposal site. This project uh, tipping, called, uh, resulted in tipping into containing uh, into a landfill, basically up to uh, Columbia River, about 150 miles. We <coughs> have a very large uh, disposal sites that have been approved for contaminated sediments. Material coming from Seattle, material coming from Portland, and a lot of, uh, where I think Seattle, Washington, a lot of material uh, south of Coos Bay, Oregon, come up and are eventually dumped at this site. This is a primary disposal site for problem sediments. Maintenance dredging is in problem PCB problem sediments that will typically go to this site. Clean sediments, this project they will tend to go to an offshore, uh, this was in uh, Seattle, Washington, they tend to go to an offshore and approved disposal site for clean sediments. Okay, next slide. That was a project, this is a confined aquatic disposal. What we're doing here is we're going to create a disposal site that we're going to dump into the water, all right? This is uh, in Bremerton, Washington. This is the uh, Navy base from Washington. Next slide. <coughs> Here we go. Picture of the aircraft carriers and ships and the school's site is located approximately in this area. Next slide. The Navy had a fee simple or ship to the outer harbor line. So we identified the pit cat as the alternative to have the material. The material there gets dredged about once every 10, 15 years. That's not very often. It's not an annual basis. Basically, if you dredge on an annual basis, a lot of your material you're going to get is relatively clean. If you dredge on a five to ten year basis, you're going to get tend to get like in a shipyard, you're going to get contaminated uh, uh, contamination from the activity of the shipyard itself. And that was the case for this. This was a 20 year maintenance problem uh, within their uh, areas. And we decided to place a pit cat site for disposal. What is a pit cat site? It's a defined flight disposal site. Next slide. Basically, we identified that area and we literally dredged <coughs> pits to place the majority of the sediment in. These three pits were clean sediments. They were actually taken down and they were used a uh, clean, sandy sediment. They were used to help develop some, uh, some habitat area in other parts of the uh, Puget Sound area. Okay, next slide. The project was dredged by a mechanical dredge again. Mechanical dredge, taking out the material. Cat did had a cat cover of uh, clean material over the unsuitable sediment that we were dredging and placing in the cat site. Next slide. This was done by bottom dump hall barges. The mechanical dredge loads of hall barges. They split. They scrub off and melt and split. Part of what I'm telling you here is we've learned a lot about dredging for problem sediments in the last 10 years. We've learned a lot about dredging for new work sediments. And of course, maintenance dredging is maintenance dredging. It's the same as it was five years, 10 years ago, generally speaking except that now we have some tendency for some additional contaminated sediment characterization. We can add four. Well, this project, we were dumping 5,000 cubic yards of sediment at a time. We each dump on the site. It's the bottom. It's down in the hole. It's 40 to 60 feet deep from the ground. Well, it hit the bottom. And then we see it go right at the sides and now across the, uh, the It was a uh, lessons learned project. We 
had a minimum amount of uh, thin layer, if you will, of contamination that actually was spread by the bottom of the building material requiring some short-term capping to mix clean material with the polymer material. Okay, so can you hear me okay? Am I talking yeah, about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, okay, I got it. I like it this way. Okay, so anyway, we let lessons learn. We don't do it that way anymore. The situation I'm trying to say is we've learned a lot of lessons, especially in the last 10 years, on newer dredging and on uh, problem sediment dredging, which is important, of course, for the for the uh, present activity in the New York Harbor. Next slide. Okay, well, then we have the fine disposal facilities, the Charleston Harbor. That's basically creating an island or a peninsula. This one is in Charleston, and it is a peninsula. Next slide. This one is a CDF, a heart motor island. I think the Baltimore District uh, Corps of Engineers used this up until 2009, last year. At that time, it was almost filled. Um, the site was uh, put out there, an island for habitat development, strictly for habitat development with limited uh, um, uh, human use, except other than go out and look at the wildlife. Okay, next slide. Here we go down now on the west coast. That was a little far the east the west coast. Okay. Wrap it up quickly. This is the San Francisco Bay project, and they are they have located a uh, uh, disposal site, and they are moving to uh, the old uh, airport, the old excuse me, the old uh, uh, Air Force Base site to create habitat. They've taken out the dikes, and now we're turning this to a, a habitat development site. And they have stopped dumping at all three of their former in bay sites in San Francisco. I've run out of time, but that's just kind of a quick overlook at some projects. What can you do? to help uh, complete the project, to get a better project, and also when you're dealing with problem sediment that a lot of our newer projects today, or maintenance projects, have. Thank you. All right, now we'd like to uh, we're gonna switch coasts and come back, uh, back east, and uh, Rick Shekels of uh, Ecologic is going to talk to us uh, about some of his experience uh, working with uh, sediment remediation and dredging issues in the Port of Baltimore and uh, with Maryland DOT and the Maryland Port Authority. Great. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, I'm from Maryland, and I have to tell you that in Baltimore there is a uh, fairly uh, new waterfront partnership that's been around for about two years, and I am just uh, overwhelmed at the, the scope of the issues being dealt with and the number of people that are involved in this conference. And so congratulations to all of you for the way you participate in these issues. Um, my background includes 30 years in the public sector uh, where I worked uh, doing environmental issues related to primarily surface transportation and seaports. And um, one of the things I did in that career is oversaw the dredging program for the Port of Baltimore. And one of the things I've learned, as you've heard here, is that there are a lot of very smart people that have uh, very good solutions for how to handle uh, sediments that we dredge for navigational purposes and other purposes. And they can pick it up, they can place it, they can build containment facilities, and they can do all that in environmentally responsible ways, uh, and hopefully in ways that are economically affordable for the sponsors. And as you know, a lot of that cost has been split historically between seaports and the Corps of Engineers. So um, I don't want to talk about any of those technical issues today because there are other experts here. But what I'd like to talk about is the process that the Port of Baltimore began to use about a decade ago. And uh, as you would imagine, in the Port of Baltimore, like many ports, uh, dredging, how to manage dredge sediments, has a very long, controversial, contentious history. Uh, I would say that in 2000, the year 2000, the Port of Baltimore lost all credibility with external stakeholders. Um, and that happened because it lost control of the rhetoric and it lost its options to place dredge sediment anywhere. I mean, the governor literally pulled the one viable option the port had left for placement of dredge sediments. And so the takeaway is that sometimes it, it does take a crisis to motivate change. And so Faced with no uh, viable options, the port initiated some very sincere discussions with the historical opponents. And in Maryland, that happened to be the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, which had a, you know, just the port and the, and the Bay Foundation had a, just a long history of head knocking with each other that wasn't very productive. And so what came out of those discussions was really a legislative solution uh, that was brokered by a couple of uh, legislative leaders in the uh, House and Senate Environmental Committees 
created a new framework, if you will, uh, by which we would engage in finding solutions and making recommendations to the gover governor of Maryland on how to, how to manage uh, dredge disposal. And what that really meant is, what are you going to do with this stuff over the long term? And so that new framework set the stage for developing consensus about dredge material management solutions. The bigger challenge, I think, was how that new framework was going to be used. You know, you had a framework, but so what? And avoiding business as usual became a very important principle for the people at the Maryland Port Administration, which is the public agency that's responsible for this process in Maryland. And um, I think the big leap of faith for the port folks and for their core partners was trusting that external stakeholders would, uh, would find balanced solutions, workable solutions. And I would say that there were several, uh, several key principles, and they were paramount to the success of this new process going forward. Uh, not the least of which is the principle that the port, the port administration, its people, did not lead the process. And so what I would say the, the six principles were that were employed here uh, fairly effectively is that the port engaged a neutral party to kind of facilitate the process. It's a, it was a group of people who could, they could speak port, they could speak community, they could speak Corps of Engineers, they knew all the constituencies, they had an understanding of what all the different perspectives really meant when somebody said something. And so helping all the parties understand what the perspectives meant in context is one of the key things that really fundamentally set the stage for making some progress. Another one is that the approach was not the traditional approach. Now I think every port uh, around the country feels like it has a pretty good process for engaging stakeholders. You know, it, you'd be dumb if you didn't try to do that and try to do it well. But the thing we, that was tried differently in Baltimore is that the port folks had somebody else go to the external stakeholders, and these were environmental organizations and neighborhood people, and said, here's the problem, the port wants your help, and there's a blank sheet of paper. And that was fundamentally different from what was done in the past, where there were lots of citizen committees and lots of environmental people involved, where the port went and said, and they did it with their core partners, they said, here's the problem, and here's what we think the right solutions are. What do you think? You're going to buy into this. And so in that process, formerly, there was no ownership by the stakeholders of what the solutions were. And some would argue the outcomes were the same. They came up with the same solutions when they all had the same information on which to make decisions and recommendations. But the approach was fundamentally different. And then last, I would say that the stakeholders very much had the lead in the process. It's the external stakeholders who were driving the train. They had the ability to ask for information and they would get whatever they asked for. And one of the things they did in the process is they identified what the community benefits were, what the community enhancements were, if you will. And I remember hearing very early in the process from an individual who said, oh yeah, we know, we know about your community enhancements. When they did the Francis Scott Key Bridge, they left the contractor's construction pier behind. And nobody in the community can use it because it's industrial, it's too high, there's no way up from the water. And so don't tell us you're going to give us a community enhancement. So just allowing the communities and the other environmental stakeholders to sort of set the priority for what the enhancements would be that go along with, with the dredge facility that gets recommended. I mean, I think that was a big difference in making a, a change and really getting ownership uh, in this process. So. Um, I would, uh, well, I hope we have a lot of time for interaction, you, that you ask a lot of questions, but the Port of Baltimore sort of institutionalized this process in a video, and uh, that's available a number of ways, and I can talk to people about that, but it's actually posted on uh, EPA Region 2's uh, Port Compliance uh, Assistance Works uh, website. So, uh, I'll stop now. involved in one of those uh, external stakeholder groups and uh, it was uh, quite an interesting process. Uh, they were, poor, poor people weren't allowed to be involved at all. We were given blank, uh, blank slate, here's the data, now tell us what we should do. And it was 
was actually a, a rather interesting model, and it did take quite a leap of faith for uh, the Maryland Port Authority to, to allow that to happen. Um, what I'd like to do now, we've heard from uh, several different uh, perspectives of things that have worked uh, in other places, uh, and, and some of the options that are available, I'd like to switch over to some of our, our local and regional uh, decision makers. Uh, we're very lucky to have Suzanne Mate from the uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation here. She's the regional director for Region 2, which includes the city here. So she's the person who's really got to uh, decide how to get her arms around regulating dredging and dredge material management uh, as we move forward with some of these uh, new and innovative solutions. So, Suzanne? Thank you. Um, as regional director for the State Department of Environmental Conservation, I came in in uh, May of 2007. And when I came to the agency, I found a staff that was overworked, exhausted. They were getting beat up by everybody. But uh, through some miracle, they still cared about their jobs, and they still wanted to do things better. And we looked at the permitting permitting program because you mentioned the issue of the regulatory process. And what I found was that there were ways to tremendously improve efficiency in the operation, how we handled the issues, how we handled communication. And in a very, very, very short period, um, starting, I kind of got my project <coughs> off uh, early in 2008. And because <coughs> 2008 and this year, we actually doubled the productivity of our permit division in terms of on-time permit decisions being delivered from less than 30% to over 60%, and we're still climbing. It's, a, it's an upward trajectory. So there are efficiencies that can be achieved within, uh, within the existing regulatory framework to solve problems, but that's really not enough. And with, the, in, with regard to the dredging issue and dredge disposal issue, we're going to have to get a lot more creative. Uh, the, the, the dredging community is going to have to learn from the recycling industry. It's very important to do that. Uh, both, both dredge material and recycling material are regulated under the same program within the State Department of Environmental Conservation. But recycling facilities are being built. We've got, we've got a, a huge uh, recycling paper plant on Staten Island. We now have a metals, glass, and plastics facility in, uh, in uh, Sunset Park. We've got other recycling facilities that have been built around the city uh, dealing with material that people used to consider garbage. And it has to do with education and working directly with the affected communities to help them understand what it is that you're doing, why you're doing it, and how you're going to be able to do it safely. It's, it's work. It's time. There are no shortcuts. There are no magic bullets. But this kind of communication has to go on. We've been able to do some things with dredge material in New York. New Jersey has been able to do more, uh, in part because of space and in part because They've got a staff dredging management team that does a great job of coordinating, um, finding spots for dredge material to go. And we're really interested in seeing that happen in New York City. But the reality is most of our larger areas, uh, the Fresh Kills landfill has already taken close to a million cubic yards of dredge material for its capping, uh, Brookfield, Landfill is going to take another 100 to 150,000 cubic yards. Uh, Pennsylvania and Fountain Avenue landfills already took um, oh, maybe 200 cubic, 200,000 cubic yards of dredge material. We don't really have a lot of landfill space in New York City where dredge material can go, and we don't even have a lot of large brownfield sites in New York City where dredge material can go in. Uh, a cover and monitoring situation. We're working on a site on Staten Island where we think it will be appropriate to place some dredge material in a careful way. Um, but we need more options. And the only way to come up with those options is to have everyone engaged in the process. 
how do we get dredge costs down is going to be very, very difficult if we can't come up with some in-water options for dredge material management. Because anytime you're putting it on land, you're going to have to, you're going to be amending the material with uh, a process that costs money. There's a lot of, of uh, work involved in that that just ends up adding a lot of dollars to the cost. Every once in a while we come up with something that's easy. Very clean dredge material, sand material was used to restore White Island in, in Brooklyn. And that ended up being a terrific project. We've been able to use <coughs> clean dredge material to restore some marsh islands. But we're going to need some new technologies or some new options because we're just plain running out of space in New York City and transportation of this material further up the river to some other place in New York, that's going to be costly too. So there aren't going to be any, any magic bullets. But I do believe that there are options that can be, be explored if people are really engaged, well informed about the process, about the safety when certain safety measures are put in place to address the more contaminated material. There are many, many ways that bridge material can be used. And as we look to changes in uh, global climate and the need to increase elevations in some areas, which we may have to do in the future, we may find some very interesting ways to use dredge material in the future. But the first thing, the first thing that has to happen is we have to learn from the recycling industry um, how to engage people in the process of problem solving when it comes to dredge material management. So we're very, very interested in being involved in that process. We're very appreciative of the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance for pulling this group of people together. I definitely want to echo that comment. Um, this, is, this kind of communication needs to happen. The other thing that I just want to, to, to add is that it's important to understand that the large dredging projects are different from the small dredging projects. They have different challenges. And the reality is that um, despite everything that we try to do to improve the permit process for the smaller companies, they've got cost considerations that are just up there. Just testing the materials is costly. Amending the materials is costly. Okay. And we have to, oh, I'm sorry. You didn't hear any of me. You didn't record anything I said. And we have to find a way. We have to find a way to get some financial assistance to the smaller operators so that they can manage those costs. Again, there are no easy answers. There are no magic bullets. This is all going to take work, and it's going to take resources to solve this problem into the future with special awareness and special concern for the smaller operators. Thank you. Thank you. I will say that there's one thing that you, you sort of hit on, hit on, and I just want to say that they haven't worked on, uh, on the contaminant assessment production project for, for, for it's, it's, its entire life uh, working through the harbor restoration program. That, it becomes a lot easier to manage sediment more creatively when it's clean sediment. And yeah. you know, the more effort that we can put into cleaning up the harbor as part of our restoration, the more options we'll have for maintaining. Absolutely. Uh, finally, last but not least, I'd like to uh, introduce Peter Davidson, who's the executive director of the Empire State Development Corporation. Uh, Peter has the uh, inevitable, inenviable uh, honor of being in charge of the remnants of the bi-state dredging plan. Uh, the, the 1996 plan that brought both Empire State and my original New Jersey Maritime Resources to the table to try to, uh, to solve the dredging problem in New York Harbor. So, Peter, what do you think? Uh, thank you, Scott, and, and I'll come to that a little bit later. But um, let me start by saying you have the five hardcore dredge <coughs> experts up here on the stage, <coughs> and, and then you have me. And the, my take on it is a little bit different. It's from the economic development angle and how all this relates to job creation and economic vitality in the port. So let me spend a little bit about time on that and frame the issues as I see it. Um, thank you, Scott, first one. This is, a, I think we went over it this morning, but just helpful to see what we're talking about here. Direct jobs related to the working waterfront 
and working water from underlying <coughs> it all is the ability to dredge, the ability to get ships in and out. That's when we talk about working waterfront at the bottom, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Nearly 45,000 direct jobs, 7.5 billion in business activity, 1.4 billion in tax revenues, directly tied to working waterfront jobs. When you expand that out a little bit to related jobs, transportation and warehousing and shipping, that jumps up to over half a million dollars, the half a million jobs, and 29 billion in wages statewide. This is just the New York side of the harbor, not the New Jersey side. Uh, one of the problems we have is we really keep looking at things on the New York side and the New Jersey side. We don't really see it as one uh, economic unit the same way we don't really see it as one environmental unit. So the, those are issues for another time. But very important. What, very important ones. Okay, the big story that's happening is the widening of the Panama Canal, <clears throat> which will be done. Huge, huge, huge global capital project going on, which will be done in 2014 or 2015. As a result of that happening, what will occur is the ships coming over from Asia loaded with wares, the huge container ships, which now have to stop on the west coast, transport their containers onto train, and then send the trains over to the east coast because they can't get through the Panama Canal. That will stop. And the new reality is that huge container ships will be able to come directly from Asia through the Panama Canal and to the east coast. So it's a great opportunity, but it's a great threat for us. Uh, Regional Plan Association and other people estimated the amount of containers coming to the East Coast will increase anywhere from 50 to 80 percent. Huge increase in potential business. Then the question is, where will those ships dock and unload? And it's really, will it be New York? Will it be Norfolk? Will it be Savannah? Will it be Halifax? And that's, uh, that's where the game is being played. And that is a very, very crucial long-term economic issue. So we are very concerned as what do we have to do to make sure that the port of New York and New Jersey remains competitive to capture on the positive a huge potential growth in business. And if we don't do it, we're losing most of the business we have because shippers all try to aggregate and bunch their, uh, their shipping business in, in one harbor. They'd rather not split the business between New York and um, Norfolk. Norfolk can do a better job, they'll move all their operations there. Okay, so here are some of the constraints. First, as you know, we have the Bayonne Bridge, which is too low. The big ships cannot get under the Bayonne Bridge. If they try, the top of them is smacked off. So it doesn't work. We need to do a capital project estimated at $3 billion to solve the problem of the Bayonne Bridge. Um, so that's one issue. You can see the heights of the, the bridges around the world, height restrictions above the water level, and we need to raise the Bayonne Bridge. Unfortunately, it's, we probably just need to raise it about 25 feet, but in order to do that, you still have to rebuild it. So we have a decision, do we rebuild the Bayonne Bridge, or some people think we even maybe just take it down. It's, there are other ways to cross. It's a, it's a complicated issue. Okay, the next slide shows what happens now with dredging. In order for these big ships to come in, we have to be at least dredged down to 50 feet. The Army Corps, which is the white line here, does dredging, do a phenomenal job of dredging in the harbor. Um, and they essentially do it for free to our harbor. It's a federal program. They dredge the channels. Everything in blue uh, is where they do not dredge. So if you are a commercial operator there, a shipyard, a marina, um, and your business lies along that coastline, you have to pay the cost of dredging, the, the guys who come in and dredge, and then if you have material, you have to pay for the disposal of that dredge. So the Army Corps does a great job for the port assets, but for the private operators, they are not really a resource in terms of dredging. Okay? This shows what has to be done uh, and is being done now in terms of dredging and dredging to depth. Uh, New York, New Jersey, we have to go down to 50 feet. We're there to, in large part, more work has to be done. Norfolk, which is our primary competitive port, is already at 50 feet. Charleston, Savannah, you see are there. The total cost of dredging to 50 feet, which is where we have to be by 2014, is $1.6 billion. Federal share, which is the Army Corps share, is, is approximately 54% of that. 
But that additional money is money that has to come be sourced locally from the port and city and state. Now, now we're getting to some of the issues which are very core, um, and one of the defining issues once we get down to 50 feet is to make it a long-term viable port. It's how do we deal with the with the dredging that's going to have to be occurring all the time? How do we really bring that dredge cost down? And here is just a, um, the magnitude of the problem. The green bar, the blue bar in the middle, is what happens if you just dredge and it's nice, clean dredge, and you can just take it out and really dump it uh, in the ocean, which is environmentally fine because it's, it's clean, it's clean fill. So no one has a problem with that. You see, the cost of dirt of clean dredge disposal is under five dollars a cubic yard. Okay. If it's considered dirty dredge which if it's not clean in New York State, it's dirty. We have a, and I'll come to this in a second, we have a binary definition of dredge. You're either clean, or if you're not clean, you're dirty, which in New York State means you're solid waste. So you can be a little bit dirty in New York State, but it's treated the same as raw sewage being dumped into the harbor. It's, it's solid waste. Other jurisdictions, and I, I believe in Jersey, you know, it's, it's a more, um, variated sense of the definition of dirty dredge. So it's, some of it is really the toxic solid waste, but some of it is <coughs> more increments where you don't have to do the heavy duty remediation, which we need to do here. But, so if we have dirty dredge, it costs $35 um, a cubic yard to dispose it, for all the reasons that uh, were mentioned before, not having locations and all the things that have to do. If we can find a way, and this is one of the points we want to make too, um, define our waste differently, so it's not just solid waste, then we could do the things where we could take, if it's not clean, but it's not fully dirty, it's a different type of classification, then that's the type of thing we could use for habitat restoration and for different types of things where the cost of the, um, of the disposal would be somewhere less than the $35 a foot. So that's one of the issues. And then here is another which Suzanne and I spent a lot of time on, and, and we're actually trying to address this, Scott, with what's left of the uh, Bi-State Coastal Fund, the dredge fund. And this is the process it takes to get a permit, a dredge permit in New York State. And you can see it's pretty long, pretty complicated, and pretty obtuse. Um, so we are really working, and, it, and it's the Department of Environmental Conservation, a, a sister agency to ours, that runs this process. And so we are trying to work, and we actually just reached an agreement uh, last month with DEC, where because they have been so hard hit in terms of personnel, that the Bi-State Dredging Fund is funding a six-person dredge management, uh, dredge oversight, uh, site selection team at DEC funded by the Bi-State team, which we think will even come up with better results than, than Suzanne just mentioned about the, the speeding up the time. So our sense is in order to solve this crisis we have of, um, of the increasing cost of dirty dredge disposal, we have to do three things. One, we have to work on the classification system we use in New York State different states, different jurisdictions have different ways of classifying. We should find something where dirty waste is not automatically considered solid waste. That's one thing we need to do. We need to focus more on increasing the transparency and the speed of our permitting process, and hopefully being able to now fund a new six-person dredge team will help that significantly. And mostly we really need to find a place to dispose of it, and we need to learn from other harbors, as we've heard, with containment islands or CDFs. That really is a, a solution. And that's something we have to get all the stakeholders on board with to, to try and find a place to locate that in New York Harbor. So that is it. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. <laughs> Just to make a quick clarification, when it comes to use, beneficial use of dredged material, that does not require a permit. And that's a misunderstanding that some people get. But for beneficial use of dredge material, and that can include material that is not perfectly clean but is being used 
in a way that is appropriate, for example, at a site where there will be proper containment and, and the kind of monitoring that you might need for material that's somewhat contaminated, um, for example, at the Brookfield, Brookfield Landfill or Fresh Kills Landfill and some other sites where we've been able to use dredge material, you simply get a beneficial use determination that doesn't have to go through a permit process. So the situation, it's, it's, those are done on a case-by-case -case basis and it's somewhat similar to the acceptable use determination. It's called a, a BUD, a BUD in New Jersey is called an acceptable use determination or an AUD. But there is some, there is some flexibility under the regulations. Thank you, Susan. Well, what, um, what we want to do now is to open up the floor for questions. Uh, I do have, first of all, thank you all for, uh, for your insights. It was, it was great. I think we, we got some stuff out on the table. I've got some great bullets for the wrap-up at the end of the day. Um, mostly, it seems that we need to be thinking cooperatively um, and thinking creatively. And I can't think of anything better than that in terms of uh, being a planner myself. That's, that's where we need to go. You know, it's, it's always thinking outside of the box and working together, and that's probably the biggest decision that we can all believe in and get behind. So, so that's a good thing. I, I, I see some interesting questions coming in. Uh, for those of you who haven't got the drill yet, um, we have these uh, three by five cards going around. So if you want to scratch out a, a question on here, um, if you have it, if you want to direct it to a specific person, please put that person's name on here so that I can do it that way. So I'm just going to run through these in no particular order. Um, this one's for, for Suzanne, so let's start with that. Says, um, made a comparison between recycling and dredge material management. Isn't the major difference significant? That is, recyclables were picked up as garbage before there were recycling plants, whereas dredging has been outright blocked in many cases, and therefore many operations closed. And I think that's what, what, the, uh, what the audience is getting at here is that uh, We've sort of demonized dredge material, and so we've kind of closed some of the doors that were open to uh, what we started thinking creatively about how we deal with solid waste. Or can I get at that a little bit? Uh, where, you mentioned this analogy between the two. Where do you see us as starting getting us thinking about reduce, reuse, recycle for dredge material? Well, I think that the, that the Baltimore example is a good one. I think the kind of setting up the kinds of teams that involve all the stakeholders, getting people talking to each other so that we understand what's really on the table, what is really in this material. A lot of people think that all dredge material is contaminated. It's not. Some of it is a lot cleaner than the soil that's in our public parks. So getting that kind of education out there so that people understand what's out there and what the options are and get people engaged in finding the solutions together, I think really is the best way to go. And I, I make the analogy to recycling simply because people have been able to make the difference in their mind between garbage and recycling. And we have kids all over the city making their parents properly separate their trash in the kitchen, and my own son did it to me. So um, we know that we can change in our attitudes toward waste and start seeing waste as as a resource. You know, we don't we don't have coal mines and and we don't have gold mines in New York City, but we have a we have a lot of dredge material and we have a lot of waste material that in fact can be reused. And if we can make that comparison and understand that these are materials that can be used again and they can be used again safely. And as you mentioned before, if we can continue to work toward cleaning up the sediment so that we have more, a broader range of options for working with the sediment, this is a problem that, you know, this is a problem that can be solved. I, I think that the blue